George, tell me about your start as a photographer. Wow, okay, well, it initially comes down to not being crazy about having my picture taken. So if you look at our family albums, I'm very present up until about nine years of age, which is when I learned how to do something on a camera. Then I'm like non-existent in pictures from about 14 years of age onwards. That's when I learned to be really good with a camera. So every time a picture needed taken at a family gathering, I'm the person taking it and I'm nowhere to be seen in the image. In terms of like thinking about photography as a kind of valid career option, that comes off the back of studying moving images, studying film with my English degree at Brunel. So that was, that, was a, that was a big thing. So I would say till today, the biggest influences behind my still photography are probably cinematographers, probably DPs. Right, so you've always been drawn to the visual image. For it? sure. Yeah. E even my connection with music probably starts from a visual perspective. I remember, so I lived in Nigeria as a kid for eight years. And my uncle lived in Lagos. We lived in the north in Kaduna. And whenever we'd go to see my uncle, he was a record producer amongst a few other things. This incredible collection of records, I would just spend forever thumbing through them with no real desire to listen to them. It was just the front covers. I was about to say, were you drawn to the, um, just drawn to the, to front the covers. artwork, sleeves, photography, etc. E even liner notes, because yeah. my mum used to say like, you know, you don't read books, you eat books. So <laughs> I have to live up to that. So I would just read liner notes from Blue Note Records or really what he had more, more than anything else in the collection were things like CTI records yeah. and Kudu records. Those things that I would later discover were quite pulsy and you know jazz purists looked down upon. Mm. But he had all of that, like Bob James things and Joe with, Farrell. With beautiful that. gatefold sleeves, like, like handsome <laughs> photography. Incredible photography. I read somewhere that the reason why CTI eventually went bust, they spent so much, money, spent on so much money on the sleeves, yeah. which is madness when you think about it because they were best-selling records, like certain CTI records, the, the Benson stuff and a few others did well. So they really didn't hold back on the quality of the, the, the visual finish, you know? Yeah, so I think even my way into the music comes from comes from kind of visual stimulation. Yeah. Right. Cool. So record sleeve design caught your eye, which if you think about it, is a very logical way to either consciously or subconsciously start a journey as a music photographer or somebody who's interested in maybe taking pictures of musicians or working in that environment. Yeah. I think when I think back to those sort of early experiences of looking at album sleeves and even books that referenced jazz and the kind of visual component in those books, it just feels really odd that it took that long from those experiences to me thinking that I could be a music photographer. The two worlds didn't meet until like my 30s. So all the pictures that I was taking in my 20s had little or nothing to do with the music scene, yet I would go to two gigs a week. <laughs> and you wouldn't shoot? I wouldn't shoot. I mean, in a way, I get it, because as I'm finding now with the night that I put on, which maybe we'll talk about in a bit, I do like to completely immerse myself in the music, and it, it's very difficult to do that when I'm thinking visually. That's yeah, me. I'm not, I'm not the multitasker when it comes to the whole visual versus audio thing. I think I, I put a flag up somewhere and that's who I am for the night normally. So when I look at these pictures that I've taken of certain gigs, I have very little recollection of what the music sounded like, even though I know what the music felt like. I can't necessarily remember the repertoire, um, the set list. Um, yeah. I think that's a fascinating question for somebody who's taking pictures of musicians playing live yeah. because you are part of an experience. You're listening unless you're wearing earplugs or something. For sure. So you have stimulus, which, yep. is, which is entering your ears, and mm -hmm. you have stimulus which is entering your eyes, as it were. You, you have audio-visual stimulus. Yeah. So how you maintain sufficient concentration to be able to shoot as well as you can, mm. because 
you, you've, you've got to obviously keep your eyes peeled and wait for the moment, mm. wait for the right moment. If you're talking about live photography, mm -hmm. I'm very interested in how you do that within this this moment, which uh, which is very stimulating. For sure, um, I would think by now some of this has been internalized, internalized to a point where. I don't think I'm making very conscious decisions about where to place the camera in relation to what I'm hearing and what I'm feeling. Mm. The feeling comes first, then maybe I start to pay a little bit more attention to what I'm hearing that might be making me feel that way. And the camera starts to do its own thing. Is it a question, again, if we're talking about shooting live events, mm -hmm. concerts, of being patient? Because I, I've always thought, when I've seen photographers in action, yep. from my point of view as a journalist uh, who's reviewing gigs, yep. I'm just trying to take in as much as possible mm -hmm. and not necessarily actively seeking something. I'm mm -hmm. waiting for something to come to me. For sure. And I wonder about shooting a gig these days, especially if you have a digital camera mm -hmm. where there's the opportunity to just keep snapping Keep snapping away. away. How, how you deal with that, the, sort of the, the, the possibility of maybe doing too much, as it were, and, and, sure. and maybe the discipline of, of yep. not doing so much. Well, I think something that has fixed that good and proper, if I ever had any scattergun tendencies, would probably be the lockdown. I think I learned something about stillness. I learned something about slowing it down to a point that, when I go to gigs now, I think it's almost an unconscious discipline to only shoot a maximum of, say, 15 images. Right. So you've, like, you've I, cut I, that down. Yeah, yeah, I've cut that. I don't know what it was before, but it was a hell of a lot more than 15. Yeah. Whereas I think now it's like that. There are some reasons, however, why I probably had some aversion towards limiting myself to 10, 15, however many pictures. And it's something to do with I'm not a fan of long lenses, mm -hmm. so wild lifestyle photography where the length of the lens can imply a relationship with the subject matter that's not really there, yeah, yeah. as in you're shooting it from the next village, but you give the impression that you're close, close with that out. person. Yeah. I've never been that fond of it as a way of shooting. I much prefer to get in there. The thing is, though, once you're in there, the musician is super conscious of what's going on, so you can't, you cannot do the... I'm gonna wait five minutes before taking a picture of you when I'm this close to you. So in a funny sort of way, you have to keep shooting to a point where they stop hearing it. They stop yeah. hearing the trigger. Yeah. So it's a funny thing, that. It's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. Yeah. Yeah, that's the best way I can put it. And you, you've been curating this really interesting night called Moments Notice mm -hmm. for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. And you've taken some fantastic photographs there. But Thank you. But you, you also have emerged as a curator. You've been programming the night, bringing musicians together. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how these two roles have overlapped and conjoined. Yeah, I mean, I would say Moments Notice is impossible for a non-practitioner unless in their own practice of photography, they are able to build those relationships with the musicians. Because I moved kind of indiscriminately in the scene, it's like a gun for hire, right? I just go and take pictures where pictures need taking, where I'm paid, whatever. I get to hear musicians who I may not get to hear otherwise. I get to build those relationships with people. They get to understand that my connection with the music is not just a visual one, but I've been listening to this music since I was very young. I remember has it been important for you to gain their trust? For, for them, sure. For them to feel comfortable That's huge. With you? That is yeah. huge because they need to know I'm not setting them up for a fall. They need to know that when I say the trio is double bass, electronic bass and drums, that it's not a gimmick and there is some method behind why I might think that could be any good. Mm. So that's huge. And musicians, especially jazz and classical musicians, can be a little bit skeptical about what non-practitioners bring to the table. So hopefully with the output so far, I've gained the trust of the majority and you know, I think the night goes well. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. And, you, and you've also 
been developing a relationship with the London Jazz Festival as well, which uh, yep. continues, and certainly this year it, it, well, it goes can, to another level. It, it goes to another level with two of the Moments Notice Nights being yeah. part of the program this year. The thing that's really worth talking about with, with those lineups is some people read it as almost trying to play God and putting these groups together that may or may not belong together. I see it very differently. I think if you're a musician coming up through the usual channels, conservatoire or, or warriors or whatever, you're gonna play with the people who are in, your, in the vicinity, the people you studied with, the people you shared a flat with, those who you've been introduced to by other musicians. The London jazz scene is small, but not that small. Mm. It is possible that you could play a number of years and not hear a particular musician just by virtue of you having your own little things. Like Cafe Otto, you know, there is, to me, there is such a thing as a Cafe Otto musician. Like yeah. it's, it's 12, 15 brilliant musicians who improvise with one another. Uh, there's there's a place for that, but it's essentially the same 12, 15 in yeah. different configurations. You, you get an idea of the sensibility of the program, for and sure. the curators, the Based on the lineups. interest that they have yep. and how they hear the music. How they hear the music. And I'm trying to mess with that, not in a forced way, but because I think it reflects my own taste. Yeah. I feel like on any given week, you are just as likely to see me at Cafe Otto as Cable Cafe, as... Um, the crypt as wherever and I have you know <laughs> Tribe Called Quest I have quite a broad taste in music so it can create for interesting stuff and so you're sharing your interests yeah I'm sharing my interest I think it's quite almost a bit selfish my 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 um curation it's like criteria a would you pay 15 quid to see this gig like me myself yes great good so I'm picking stuff that I would pay a lot of money to see and I and hear. So hopefully it resonates with, with other people. With other people. I, I believe that it, they do. So, yeah. George, from your point of view, not just as a photographer, yeah. but as a music lover and, and also the layperson as well, what makes a good photograph, we're talking about, of a musician? Wow. It could be a live shot or a portrait. Mm -hmm. What does it have to say to you? For it to for it to catch your eye. Well, that's a question. I mean, for me, I'm very particular about when I look at other people's pictures, mm -hmm. about the picture revealing something about the relationship between photographer and subject. subject yeah. That's quite big for me. Even if somehow the relationship is invisible, as in you don't see the camera, that's good because it tells me something about the humility of the photographer. Mm -hmm. So I don't mind those pictures that in a way don't make me question that at all. I have a direct connection with the image. It's only a problem where I immediately see the photographer in the picture and I somehow don't believe that relationship. That's often to do with placement of camera where you immediately think, what's the lens doing down there? Right. That's not a natural place for so it's something to do with that, but there's also another part of it for me, which is just an emotional thing. It's always heart first for me. And I don't mean that in a sentimental way. I just mean, do I feel something when I look at the picture? Yeah. That comes first. Only then do I start to dissect. I might just look at a picture for 20 straight minutes, looking at one picture. So that might come from the facial expression, the way the body is held, maybe the way the instrument is held, yeah. the relationship between the subject and the light and the background. I mean, there are lots of different things. Yeah, lots of different things. Account, I, I, yeah. I think with jazz photography that you see, you know, historically, yeah. quite a lot has been put on the style. For me, an overemphasis on the style over the content. There was a time and place for that that is of interest to me. So high contrast, black and white photography from the 50s and early 60s yeah. seems to capture something of its moment. You know, classic blue note sleeves. Classic blue note sleeves, whatever. I get a tiny bit uncomfortable when I see that as a default style used yeah. now. Yeah. I don't personally experience... Well, it can become a cliche. It can become a cliche. Yeah. So for me, I'm always trying to look for a more honest, for me, way of representing what I'm hearing and seeing, and it's not necessarily that. So. Tell us about the digital exhibition 
uh, that you have coming up as part of this year's London Jazz Festival? Okay, so that would be my introduction to, you know, Sirius and the London Jazz Festival was this um, press pass, essentially, that I got last year with a view to shooting material potentially to exhibit this year. And you know, 400 gigs in 10 days is <laughs> like, I don't even know where to begin. Is, it's, is that overwhelming <laughs> and stimulating in equal measure? So for me, I thought, well, to shoot kind of gig photography straight for a week is something I could have done without a press pass. Mm. So why, do, why don't I shoot something that I wouldn't have been able to unless I had a press pass? Yeah. So a big part of the focus here is rehearsals, backstage. green room, backstage, literally 10 seconds before musicians yeah. start improvising on stage. That's a big part of it. So the exhibition is titled 4-4 for the festival, not just because it's a bit tongue twisty and that's like a weird thing that I'm into, but because um, I like the idea of giving classic form to something that's kind of impossible to contain. <laughs> like these 400 gigs, I thought, how can I just whittle it down and get it orderly? So I quite like the kind of four rooms concept of, you know, dealing with the festival. So the first room is a rehearsal room where you will see two different bands rehearsing for tribute gigs. Mm -hmm. One being a Tony Allen tribute that was fronted by Femi Colioso, mm -hmm. and the other being a Marvin Gaye tribute that's the new it's Civilization uh, Orchestra. Femi from Ezra Collective. Femi from Ezra. So I found that interesting in itself, that these two tribute gigs at the London Jazz Festival were not tributes to musicians who would be immediately thought of as jazz. Now that's a long, slightly dull conversation to get into the what is jazz, but it is just becoming the norm now, I think, for a certain generation of our musicians now to just on default reference Afrobeat or funk or soul musicians. It's as become part of the it's vocabulary. It's just part of the vocabulary now. And I thought that was really fascinating and that became the first room. The second room for this, um, looks at um, um, UK musicians, a young generation, who would probably be typically headliners mm -hmm. who were supporting American musicians. And um, I'm always interested to know how the headliner deals with the support slot, whether it affects the way they play in some way, do they feel like their role is to set the table or is their role to just knock it out and set an impossible task for the next band? But again, it's behind the scenes. It's the behind the scenes of Shosha Cole and Joe Downard's duo gig prior to Cecile McLaurin Salvant's gig, and behind the scenes of Jazz, Kesa and Chum's band before the Theo Croker, um, Casa Overall gig. Then you've got um, a third section, which is seen from the American musician's perspective, but not those American musicians that were headlining. So irreversible entanglements would be one, and Damon Locks's Black Monument Ensemble were the two American groups that were, you know, headlining shows here. And I do a behind the scenes sort of look at those guys and their pre-gig rituals, mm -hmm. of which some of which are like nothing you've seen in certainly in the jazz scene. Yeah. Um, well, we'll be able to see them because you'll, of the, you'll, uh, you'll be able to, you'll be able to see them. But but you know, with 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 all three of those, you never see the gig. So it's a little bit like... Um, it's what's happening around it. It's what's happening around it, and it's cut in that way or edited in that way. So if you've ever seen um, Colonel Blimp, the um, Powell and Pressburger yeah. film, and this big build-up to the duel, and then you don't see the duel, the, the camera just kind of pulls right. away. So it's a little bit like that. Yeah. Or maybe a more obvious example of that would be King of Comedy, where you see this De Niro character, and he's clearly a person with issues, yeah. and you really fear for his stand-up routine that he's going to do after he's kidnapped the Jerry Lewis character and then you don't see it initially. Yeah. You just see him walk into this bar, he turns on the TV, shows it to the girl who can barely believe he has Creating done it. Creating a certain expectation and then not fulfilling it. And then it. not fulfilling it. So, yeah. so for me, it, 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 that's not a gimmick at all, but it's more the character has been built up sufficiently that we can kind of, pe we, I think we can piece together what what his routine would have been like, or 
what the duel is going to be like in Colonel Blimp. The difference in King of Comedies, they actually show the set later on, like isolated from its natural point in the timeline. Right. So yeah, like, like I said, films are, I think, as big an influence in my, not just, a, not just a shooting style, but in an editing style and sequential storytelling style as okay. still pictures. Yeah. yeah. George, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. We really cool. look forward to the exhibition. Nice. Can't wait to, to see that. Um, Great. Is there anything in particular that you're looking forward to um, at this year's London Jazz Festival? I'm going to really try and see Sosha Cole and Hamid Drake. Mm. And I think I'm going to try and see Lucia Kadosh's thing with Kit Downs, mm. Aki, right? Yeah. So I think Aki is on the 12th and Sosha Cole's thing is on the 13th which is on the same night as one of my gigs, my gigs in the afternoon. So in the afternoon, Ben Lamar Gay is playing a duo with Simon Roth. Um, and then there's a trio of Joshua Ederhan, Alina on harp, and um, Rebecca Reed on violin. So that's an afternoon gig. As soon as that finishes, I think I'm gonna jump and try and catch um, Shosha Cole's duo gig with Hamid Drake. Right. I'll see you there. Nice, cool. Thank you. Thank you.